Today, I'm going to tell you a couple of what I would consider uh, my keys to success over the years. Um, but before I get into the, the remodeling building side, I am curious uh, of you out there, I've met a few of you, how many builders in the room would you consider yourselves builders? And how many would say, if someone introduced you, this is a remodeler? What would you say, how many of you would say you're strictly remodelers? Okay. Any, anybody else I'm missing? Any uh, BMC employees here? We've got a couple BMC guys here. Awesome. Thanks for coming, y'all. Architect, too? We got an architect? One, how many architects do we have? One, two, three, four? Something like that? Awesome. Thanks for coming, y'all. So uh, I've been in business now. For, I've been a professional builder now for about 25 years. Uh, I've gone through a couple of name changes in that time. I currently call myself Reisinger Build. I did a uh, brand change last year. But um, you know, my, my company was started, my building company that I currently run, I started in 2005 after having worked for other people for about 10 years. We've grown a little bit over that time, but mainly we focus on being an architect's builder. So these architects in the room, uh, my main focus in Austin, and I actually have a guy who does pretty much uh, sales for me, or I forget, business development is the correct uh, millennial term for that. Uh, his main job is to go out to architects and say, hey, we're a great builder. We'd love to build for you. Why don't you refer us business? And the cool part about that is we get businesses both new home builds and remodels. Now, as the economy's gotten better, we're doing less of the smaller-ish remodels, and we tend to kind of say, hey, we'll only do remodels if it's whole house remodels. But if you've seen my videos, um, I don't like doing things kind of halfway, and that's one of the big reasons why I stopped doing the kitchen bath uh, addition kind of remodels, because I didn't like leaving things uh, that weren't quite to my standards. And many of you probably have experienced that as well. But one of the things I love about coming to speak with builders is that we are an incredibly uh, generous crowd, I've found over my 25 years. We're also generally a very high integrity crowd. Uh, we also care very much about our families and our work-life balance. So as I've met several of you the last couple of days, um, I'm humbled to be asked here and you know that really the only reason I'm up here and you're not is because I have this nerdy YouTube channel. That's really the only difference, because many of you uh, have seen and done more than I have. In fact, uh, I was talking to this remodeler uh, out of Houston who's been doing this for 40 years, so it makes my 25 look like a drop in the bucket. But if you've been in the remodeling or building world, you know that mistakes are what we call experience. And I, I love this, uh, this quote. But I'm gonna run through a couple of my experiences, shall we say, over the years, and we're gonna kinda talk about how you can turn those experiences into success, and then also how you can use those experiences uh, to not make the same experience later, if you know what I mean. So one of the things about building, or one of the things about remodeling, I should say in particular, that I've really liked over the years is it's allowed me to see how houses have fared over the years. So for instance, one of the things I talk a lot about on YouTube is air tightness. You know, we want to build tight and ventilate right. You've probably heard me say that on video if you've seen any of my videos. And I always get pushback in the comments. You know, at least 20% of the comments are, you're an idiot, houses are too tight, you're gonna kill people. And I always think, have you ever remodeled a house? Do you know what comes in when air comes into the houses and what happens when we see air leak? We find all kinds of nasty stuff. And one of the other things that, that um, that I find that really gets people on a remodel is you open up those walls and you start seeing how much bug and rodent and other activities there are in a house, it freaks the heck out of people. Like I'm doing a remodel now on, on a house that's my personal project, I've called it the Real Remodel Series on YouTube, and there's a spot in the kitchen where rats were getting in through the sheathing, kind of a hole in the sheathing. And I was absolutely disgusted to see how much rat droppings were everywhere behind the sheetrock on this house. Now, obviously, if rats can get in, air can get in, but if we can tighten those holes down and do a better job, that's gonna be something that's gonna make a huge difference for our clients. The other thing that really gets me uh, about remodeling is that I get to see houses among a bunch of different age spectrums. So for instance, this is one that I remodeled a little more than 10 years ago now, and the house at the time was only a six, seven, eight year old house. In fact, I knew the builder who built this house Pretty typical Texas Tuscan style. This is one of my first de-Tuscan remodels where we were kind of turning a Tuscanized 
you know, we're in Italy in the Foothills house into a much more contemporary house. But man, even on a new house, we found all kinds of crazy issues. And if you, if you see on the left-hand side of that slide, see that greenish kind of rock? After this, seeing this, I don't know, 10, 10 plus years ago now, every time I see green rock on a house, I'm always thinking, I wonder what's behind that green rock? What are we gonna find? And man, we find a lot of this, like you see in this, in this particular uh, picture. You can tell the difference between the uh, dark OSB and the uh, kind of uh, dark brown OSB. Obviously know what that is, right? There are some water issues here. But even in another area where there was uh, more of an overhang, sprinklers were hitting the house. They did a terrible job of installing the windows. They had black paper uh, as their weather-resistant barrier, and it was mislapped as if they'd tucked their rain pants into their rain boot. And look how bad that, um, that OSB looked on a six, seven-year-old house. It was getting white mold on a relatively new house. Very, very uh, young. So, I think as a remodeler, if you are currently a remodeler or if, if you're really doing new homes, it's one of the best ways to learn building science because we end up seeing so many of the failures. And it's one of the things that gets me so uh, kind of hyped up or upset about the national builders. And I try to not talk about this too much on YouTube because I try to generally be positive. But you know, this is a picture of a house under construction. I took this picture maybe a year ago about 15 miles from my house in Austin, Texas. I live 10 miles from downtown, so this is 25 miles out of the city. This is one of the national production builders, if I told you their name. And uh, all those houses out there are being built with thermoply sheathing, with no particular details towards air tightness, with very lax waterproofing details. And you know what? That's the same darn house I built in the 90s when I worked for a production builder. And now that I'm remodeling my 70s house, guess how that 70s house was built? The same exact way. Couldn't we have learned something as a builder community in the last 40 years? Do you really think our clients would stand for us uh, giving them a new Lexus that was built like a set 1970s Lexus? Man, we've got to do better as an industry. Now, I know you guys here are not in that same boat. This is kind of preaching to the choir, so to speak. But let's, let's look at uh, a couple of examples of some of those old houses that I've worked on. Now, here's the pretty end picture of a, a house, um, but here's the before picture. This is a 1930s house that I did in Austin. This is a couple years ago now. This, I probably finished this six, seven years ago. Um, but fairly similar front facade. We kind of popped the top on the house. We added some crazy kind of modern dormers. But don't you love how builders put images like this on their website, including me? Here's what builders don't show you. Here's the same house five years later when I got, I got a call from the owners. Hey, Matt, all of my paint is peeling on my south facade. What? Ryan, why didn't you call me sooner? Really? And it looked terrible. Hopefully you can see that in the back. We're looking at a, uh, a true wood exterior uh, siding. That's actually the original siding on the house that I pulled, meticulously stripped, uh, primed on all, all five sides, put on a rain screen and put back on the house you know, five years prior to this. And son of a gun, wouldn't you know it, all that darn paint within, it probably wasn't even five years, probably within three years, was really peeling and looking terrible. And here I am, the building science guy, telling the client, so we're gonna do this right. You know, we're gonna prime this, we're gonna put it on a rain screen, we're gonna do this right. I had, to, had to, I had to pay to come back and fix it and do it right, and it really bugged me. But those are the kinds of lessons that are hard to pass on to, you know, a remodeler who's just starting in the business. These are the, these are the kind of life lessons that you learn uh, and go, gosh, I missed two critical details. Number one, there's no venting on the top of that rain screen. Uh, if you can see that gable right there, the siding goes right up to the gable and there's no air gap up there. It's all cocked in meticulously. So yes, it's on an air gap, but if there's no air flow, you might as well not be on an air gap. The other thing that I messed up big time on this is this is longleaf pine, which is a hundred and some years old or so at the time, or maybe not quite, 90 years old, let's say. Well, longleaf pine turns out incredibly oily and uh, uh, the old carpenters back in the 40s and 50s called it turpentine pine. And so I got my primer wrong on this job. I didn't pay attention. I let the, the painter figure out what primer we needed. I didn't do the research on turpentine pine. Sure enough, we ended up 
spending, I don't know, 7,500 bucks repainting this house this past year. It was painful. We also came back and retrofitted all those gables with airflow so I could get a full rain screen airflow vent on the top and the bottom. Here's one of my bigger mistakes though. I have not talked about this one on YouTube a whole lot. Um, this is a house that I started construction on in 2007 when I was a relatively new builder to Austin, Texas. If you don't know my story, I, I built for uh, seven years in the East Coast market. I built with a production builder. And then uh, after getting married, my wife and I moved uh, to Portland, Oregon for a couple years and I worked uh, for a semi-custom builder in Portland. And I learned a lot about uh, uh, rain screens and mold and water intrusion, frankly, because we made a lot of mistakes. And I have talked about some of those on my videos. So then when I moved in Texas in 2005, I started my home building company and I had zero clue about the market. I didn't know anybody. I didn't really know how I was going to run a home building company, but I knew I wanted to be a custom builder. So I did um, three speculative projects. You all know what I mean when I say a spec house. It means that I took care of the financing. I went to an investor and said, hey, will you loan me this money? I'm going to give you this percent of the uh, profit on the job. And so I did two of them, and I did kind of okay, not great on those, but I, start, I was starting to kind of build a reputation, so that part was good for me. But this house we started in 2007 when the market was at an all-time high. I was on top of the world. I figured, you know, we'd sell this house for... 1.3 million in this infill neighborhood. I had about a million into it, so I was going to make, you know, $300,000 on this spec project. Well, you all know what happened in, in 2007, 8. We went from an all-time high to a massive crash, and here I had this house well under construction at that point um, that was looking cool and contemporary, but in the end, I sold it in 2010 when I was so thankful to sell it for $750,000. So you can do the math yourself on that one. It was a 250K loss. Meanwhile, during the recession, I was running my credit cards to the max. I had one or two, I guess I had two kids at the time. My wife was working like 30 some hours a week to pay our bills because I was making negative money. The, um, the uh, debt service on that spec house was like $6,700 a month. Um, and then when I finally did sell it, I was able to pay off uh, most of my construction loan. Every one of my subs got paid. I'm thankful that, uh, uh, that I was able to do that. Uh, I didn't declare bankruptcy, but I had to go to my investor and say, I know, I I know you loaned me $250,000 and I you were gonna make this percentage of the profit. Well, the profit is minus 250. So I'll pay you every penny of that back um, with no interest, but I won't give you any profit because there isn't any profit. Uh, and by the, oh, by the way, the investor was a family member, so he was like, okay, sure, I'll do that. So it took me from 2010 to 2015 to finally pay that off, and I was paying around that same 6,500 bucks. Uh, around the company, we nicknamed that check that went out every month, Chuck, the employee that we couldn't fire that worthless Chuck. Dang it, Chuck. Finally fired a Chuck in, uh, in 2015. And this really doesn't necessarily have anything to do with building, but I can tell you from a personal note, uh, having that massive debt, also massive credit card debt, I'd taken my credit cards, every one of them, to the very brink of what I could possibly borrow. And now I have two kids. Man, it was a brutal time. Now, there was a guy at my church at the time that was doing basically like a Dave Ramsey type ministry. And I'd taken the class, you know, here I was up to beyond my eyeballs in debt. And he recommended this software. I have no affiliation with them. There's no code to use that I make $10 for you to sign up. I just have used it ever since and it's been really, really good. But my point is, in these good times, we have no idea when these times are going to end. We really, really need clients like this. This is Stan and Catherine Aldrich, who around that same time signed up in the dead heat of the recession for a cash remodel on a million eight hundred thousand dollar project. Man, is it nice to bill clients every month and not have to worry about, am I going to sell it or am I not going to sell it? And so the lesson learned on that one, and I finally did pay off both those debts, and today the only debt I've got is just a little bit of house payment left. Um, the lesson for us as small businesses uh, and as individuals, let's say if you're a BMC employee, go into a recession debt-free. 
you do not need a fancy truck, you do not need a boat payment, you do not need a spec house that you may or may not sell. It was a really, really hard and very challenging time in my life. And now, if things change, it's gonna be a whole different deal. And that's one of the beauties about remodeling, frankly, is during the recession, I couldn't, I couldn't sell a new home to save my life. Nobody could. But yet, I was actually growing in my business because I was doing really good whole house remodels, and there were people like Stan and Catherine and several others that had the cash that weren't 100% stock market invested people and said, hey, my life needs this now. I don't care what the market's doing. I need a remodel. And man, I actually grew my business significantly doing remodeling during the recession. It was actually financially a great time for me. I didn't make a ton of money, but I paid off 300,000 bucks in debt in five years uh, and really changed my business. So here's lesson number one for y'all if you're a note taker. Get debt free. That one's been huge for me. Running my company and my business debt free, uh, both personally and professionally. Man, if I could give any advice to a, to a builder who's younger than me or a few of you have some grayer hair than me, I'm 47, so I'm older than you think. Uh, it's this one, you know, be really cautious. And profit, man, profit is important for us as builders. We've got to have profit to lubricate our businesses. We also need to have some of that profit squirreled away for that rainy day front. Just like anybody who's in budgeting will tell you, you need a couple months salary squirreled away, we need that for our businesses too. Very, very important. Um, one little quick story about the recession. Uh, I think I'm okay on time here, yeah. Uh, I had a, a builder friend that I knew kind of leading up to the recession, that uh, uh, he wasn't a nemesis or, or a uh, competitor so much, but he was one of those people that you look at and you go, my gosh, that guy's successful. What is his formula like? How can I be him? He was like one or two years younger than me. He always drove a Range Rover. He always dressed impeccably. And, you know, I just had a couple kids. I was 40 pounds overweight. I was trying to look cool. It was before I was finally like, just wear the same thing every day, Matt. Don't be an idiot. I was like trying to look nice at the job. And this guy was president of the Home Builders Association. He had an incredible portfolio on his website. I was super jealous of him, frankly. I was, I was totally thinking he was killing it. And sure enough, when the recession hit, even with all that, he had a giant spec project. And man, that project took him down big time. He ended up having to move out of town. He left several of my big subs uh, underwater to the tune of six figures plus, some subs that we shared that I knew. And so it made me realize, look, looks aren't everything. Don't be deceived by someone's success because they drive up to a meeting with you uh, in a BMW or some other fancier car that you're not driving. Uh, I, I currently, my pickup truck for work is a uh, 2008 Tundra with 150,000 miles. And every time I think, wow, it'd be really fun to have that new Chevy that I want, I think, you know what? This thing's fully depreciated. <laughs> it's costing me gas. I should save this thing. All right, now let's move on to some nerdy stuff. Now that we're uh, done with the business side, you know, this is one of my, uh, my biggest topics on my videos, and I feel like I need, to re I need to touch on this every time I talk to people because, man, it's, it's come back to bite me so many times. And if any of you have uh, ever been in the situation where you've, you've gotten to a uh, tiff with a client, 80% uh, of those that end up in lawsuits are because of this right here. And we all know what that is, right? It's water, whether it's condensation, whether it's bulk water, whether it's a leak, any of those things. Now, anecdotally, uh, the construction attorneys that I know in Austin, some of them are so busy right now with litigation, they are not even taking new clients. They, can, they cannot even service their current clients. So if you're a new builder in Austin and you call several of the top firms, they're gonna say, I'm really sorry, <laughs> you're gonna have to find somebody else. We've got no ability to help you. And these are like construction specific law firms. So this is incredibly important for us as builders. This is where our, our liability uh, rests, whether you're a builder or a remodeler. So let me go back to the basics and be super nerdy just for a second here. I stole this slide from Building Science Corporation. And we all know this stuff, but it's, it's good to, to uh, review it again, even for a, a seasoned uh, builder remodeler. You know, our, our buildings basically have three roles that they play, right? There's an outer layer that serves as a protection role. There's a control layer that's gonna serve to control what's happening to the house. And then there's a structural layer. 
Now, as I've gotten a chance to travel this past year, if you've seen any of my videos, the rest of the world does things very differently when it comes to support than America does. You know, for instance, when I was in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, they don't do anything that's not concrete block down there. Now, big reason is there's also seven trees in the entire island, and we have a very different island over here in North America, but same thing goes with the Europeans. You know, they don't use a lot of wood. Now, here in America, we have massive national resources, and we also have Canada sending their natural resources down to us. Wood can last a really, really long time. I had a conversation with one of you yesterday, and I can't remember who it was. Who was the guy who went to Japan that I was talking to yesterday? That's right, we were talking about his, Jap his Japanese, I'm sorry, Dan, right? Dan, sorry, Dan. Dan, Legal Eagle Contractors in Houston. Dan was in Japan this past year on a speaking tour, uh, kind of his rock star uh, speaking tour in Japan. He went in wood buildings that were 1,500, 2,000 year old wood buildings. Is there anything wrong with wood? No, wood is an amazing product. God gave us a tree that we can make just about anything with. The key is keeping it dry. The, the thing I always tell people when they're like, oh, wood's a terrible building product, I tell them, how long can your dining room table last? Well, your dining room table in your dining room is not rotting away anytime soon, is it? No, it's because your dining room table lives in the same environment you do. It's dry, it's dehumidified, it's protected from rain, it's generally within about plus or minus of 70 degrees its entire life. You could resell that dining room table 500 years from now and it would look the same, minus maybe some finishes. So if we use wood for our structure, what should we be really cautious about? Our control layers. That's the outside of the building. And if you see the 500-year uh, house that I built in Austin, show of hands, anybody saw, the, saw those videos? If you haven't, go check out that series of videos. It's a, it's a uh, house that's built with a concept from Building Science Corporation called Perfect Wall, where the structure uh, is fully protected on the outside with basically a peel and stick membrane that goes from the foundation to the ridge and all the way back down again. So a, a big uh, plastic wrap, basically. And then outside of that, there's insulation. So the insulation's on the outside, or outsulation. And then outbound of that is basically a metal facade, which is the support layer, or pardon me, the uh, protection layer on this uh, diagram. Now, what do you notice about the protection layer? The protection layer has some holes or some gaps in it. Do we need our hardy plank siding to be perfectly caulked if it's on a rain screen and we've done a good job of uh, making that our outside raincoat? No, we just needed to shed the water and ultimately, we really need it to keep the UV rays off the other layers. Now, what is that support layer, or pardon me, what's that control layer doing for us? It's controlling four things. Now, I'm sorry if, if you've heard this 100 times, but I love talking about it, right? It's controlling the rain. It's controlling what's happening from the sky. It's controlling air movement. It's controlling vapor, which is a pretty important thing, especially for you uh, northern builders. Uh, and I've got a really interesting video coming up in about a week that I'm going to publish showing how a hose bib through a wall is transmitting the cold into our houses and may actually be uh, condensing quite a bit into your walls so that you don't realize because that hose bib is cold from the outside. You've got metal running from outside to in. And if you don't do a good job of your vapor and air control layers, you may actually be dumping a lot of water into your walls. And then lastly, thermal, our insulation, right? We think about insulation first. Our inspectors care about insulation. They're making sure that our, every area is insulated. But in the scheme of things, it's really this order that matters the most. Insulation is kind of the least important control layer of those three. No one's getting a call in the middle of the night uh, at 2 a.m. that they've got a control layer for insulation missing. Oh my gosh, my floor is cold in my bathroom, Matt. Can you get over here? 6 a.m. and take a look at that? No, but they're sure gonna call you if they have a leak out of a window or a roof, aren't they? Rain is what it's all about. Now here's an example of uh, a builder show gone wrong. This is, uh, you, you may have seen this, I, I've used this example before, so I apologize if you've seen this on some of my videos, but uh, this goes back to my Portland, or Oregon building days. Uh, this is around the year 2001, 2002, something like that. If you went to the International Builder Show around the year 2000, there was a new product on the market that everyone was talking about called EFS, E-I-F-S. Anyone know what it stands for? We can shout it out. That's right, E-I-F-S. Man, I think you deserve a hat for that. Good job, brother. Um, so EFS, Exterior Insulated Finishing System. 
everybody was talking about at the Builder Show this year, that year, and there was probably, I don't know, three, four manufacturers that were talking about it. Now, builders loved it because you got this exterior insulation, but their back motive was it was like half the cost of traditional stucco, or maybe less. And basically what you did, now this is a house that we de-skinned because we built about a dozen of them. We were snowed by it too in that year. Uh, and we put it on a bunch of houses in Portland, Oregon, one of the rainiest climates uh, in, <laughs> in North America. And this is a one, maybe 16 month old house with real plywood, not even OSB. And look how bad it looked underneath the EFAS. Now if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the EFAS, as a builder we would basically take a four by eight sheet of EPS foam, like you know your uh, coffee cup foam, like a Dunkin' Donuts coffee cup, EPS foam, that white uh, kind of, you have not that kind of coffee cup, sorry, regular coffee cup foam. Uh, and you would, on the back side of that, basically put this mastic on it, that you can kind of see the trowel marks on the foam, right? And you would just pop it right on the face of the building. Now this building did have plywood, not OSB, slightly less water sensitive. But once you stuck that on, then you'd take this bucket of this, uh, of this synthetic stucco, a latex-based stucco, and then you would just trowel it on, and it was integral color, you'd walk away, you're done. Man, they could install the whole EFAS facade on the house in like two days, it was money. One day to stick the foam on, the next day put that up, I guess three days. The third day, the painter came and caulked everything. And man, you had to be meticulous about your caulk. You'd caulk every window, every penetration, everything had to be money caulked. And you know how good production builder, builder painters are. I mean, those guys, I mean, they get, they get paid well, they're happy to be at work, everyone's doing their finest work at 8 a.m. when you're a production builder painter. So our guys may have missed a few things here and there. Also, have you ever seen a caulk joint fail before? I, I mean, caulk lasts like 50 years without failing, right? We never have problems. Well, here's a one-year-old house, and you can see where all the, all the issues were. Basically, those windows right above it there, I'm sure the caulk was not perfect at the corners or maybe cracked. A little bit of water was getting in. We're not talking a fire hose of water, a little bit of water, and sure enough, massive rot on real plywood again, right? And you would think, oh, that plywood will dry to the inside, you know, no problem. Well, no, it was thoroughly rotted. Now, we did have, at that time, poly on the inside of the walls, you know, a pretty zero perm uh, vapor barrier, which we needed a vapor barrier in that climate. It was cold, but man, it was in terrible shape. And that's when I, as a 30, I don't know, 30 year old, let's say, said, man, I've been in this business for almost 10 years now. Well, not quite, seven, eight years, nine years at that time. And we've been building things like we always had with whatever products were there and whatever we were ordering from uh, BMC, but we weren't thinking about how things were put together. We were basically just going with the flow. This is a cheaper, a better product, great, let's do it. Sounds good, we just saved 5,000 bucks on our stucco costs compared to traditional three coat. But man, was it costly to take care of those houses between the lawyers, restuccoing them with real stucco, doing all the details right, pulling the windows and resetting them. It was expensive. I learned a ton in Portland and really kind of buried my head into building science because of the time that builder I was working for was basically my age now. He was in his mid 40s and he owned this giant company that was getting sued right and left. To his credit, he didn't go out of business. He was able to kind of hang on. Uh, it was helpful the economy was bumping during that time. But I thought, gosh, if I ever own my own company, I'm not gonna make those mistakes. I'm gonna really do it right. I'm gonna really study building science. So fast forward a couple years, in, and I'd moved to Portland now. This is maybe three, four years later. I had a, a little bit of an ego, a little hubris, like, oh, I can, man, I can do any, I'm, I got the building science, I got this. I'm the best builder in Austin. So this remodel comes to me. This is a, uh, I don't know, 1930s, 40s house, let's say, real salt box in the front. There's the before and there's the after. Uh, so, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty iconic house. The architect did a good job of kind of contemporizing it and cleaning it up. But uh, it was what I would like to uh, call a mullet house, uh, if you're familiar with the term. Uh, it was definitely uh, a little bit of a contemporary party going on in the back of the house. And this was my very first house I'd built with parapet walls, uh, with scuppers. Y'all know what scuppers are on the outside of a house? I'm not even gonna get into all the issues I've made with that. Um, but here's one in particular that, uh, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. 
the windows at the house, the client called me within, I don't know, six, seven months, Matt, my windows are leaking. And I went over there and said, oh, your windows aren't leaking, it's just condensation. You know, no big deal, we just need to wipe this condensation up, we're gonna add a dehumidifier, I just learned about dehumidifiers, we're gonna put a dehumidifier in, we'll totally take care of that, should be fine. This is aluminum, non-thermally broken. So then, you know, another month or two goes by, we'd put a dehum in, by the way, Matt, my windows are still leaking, like you can see a puddle on some of these windows. It's no big deal, you just need to wipe that up. Well, maybe we shouldn't have drywall touching it. Okay, we'll, we'll cut out that drywall and like make a little trough for the water to collect. Problem solved, right? Client calls me again, Matt, my windows are still leaking. So I get that out there with Mundo, my roofer. This is when I first met this guy. Um, and oh, by the way, I built this house during the recession. And at that time, the client said, Matt, I'm not sure if I can go forward to this house at this price point. I don't know what the house is priced at. I bid it at, you know, $600,000. I don't know what the numbers were. Matt, I need you to scrub these numbers. Every sub, you need to go back to them and tell them it's the recession. You need to lower your price. And if not, we're going to bid it to five other people. And I was like, oh, gosh, yes, sir, okay. So we had like three, four roofing bids, and I went with the cheapest guy. Now, mind you, this was not the roofer I wanted to use. I wanted to use the guy who had the 30-year reputation in Austin, but instead I used the guy who was actually a builder but also did some roofing on the side. So he was a low bid, of course. So we get out there now, two years later, a year and a half, year later, Mundo's looking around, we got a head flashing. I know I put those windows in with, you know, all the good sill pans. I, what do you think, Mundo? I don't know, Matt, you just gotta, we gotta tear this thing out and see what the problem is. So we tear it out, and my guys call me, there's Sam on the right, I've been building with Sam for a long time, Sam just retired recently, but Sam calls me, Matt, you gotta get over here, Hefe, this looks bad. Is it the window, what, what was the problem, did we, did we put it in wrong? Nope, not the window, can y'all see what it is? Y'all know, right? Scupper, that's right, Matt. The Stupid scuppers, I would like to swear here, but my children may watch this. Almost every scupper on the house leaked. I was an idiot, I didn't know any better. I'd never built a scupper before. I'd never done a parapet wall. My roofer, slash a builder who was doing roofing on the weekends, had put these scuppers together, which is basically a big hole through your envelope, you know, all your control layers, and he had caulked them together. The metal was caulked. How long do you think that lasted? Not long. Now here it is like 2008 or nine at this point. Hey buddy, wait a minute, your phone's not working anymore. Are you still, hey call me back when you get a chance please. I got nothing. I paid for every penny of the new roof of all, almost, well we didn't have to tear the whole stucco out, but eight inches or, t or a foot around the entire house got torn out of stucco so I could fix every one of the scuppers. I had a ton of rot to fix. It was really, really painful. And remember, this is the time when I had 300,000 in debt I was paying off too. Thank God those clients were paying every bill for me uh, of theirs on a cash basis. They had the money. But this is a valuable lesson I learned during this time. And the lesson was don't bid. Now this is a, this is a deeper topic than just drop that bomb and leave it. But you know, I got seriously pulled in to the client in terms of cost, uh, what's, the, what's the correct uh, term? Uh, we're not cutting costs, we're value engineering, that's it. I did some serious value engineering to make sure the project went, right? I needed the work, but man, what an idiot. I paid for all 30 grand of that out of my pocket. I wish I could have gone to the client and said, well, you made me take the low bidder, so you need to pay the 30 grand. What do you think he would have said? Heck no. You can hear from my attorney and you're gonna owe me a hundred grand is what he would have said. No, 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 I was the one who made the mistake. I allowed them to dictate how to build the house. And we're the builders, we're the experts. We need to dictate how we build our houses. It's incredibly important for us to be the experts and to tell people how to bid or how to uh, build. And that, of course, has a lot to do with price. And this is a hard topic, right? I mean, every, no matter how good the economy is, no matter how rich your clients are, just about every project's over budget. Whether you build $5 million houses 
or $200,000 remodels, your first time you start talking about budget, that's way too much. They could never afford that, right? They have to have that uh, 13 car garage. They, there's no way they could go down to a nine car garage. That would be silly. They have to have the quarter million dollar home theater in the basement. There's no way we could drop down to 200,000 for a home theater. No, no, we are the experts. And one of the things that I did that made a giant change in my business was this. This is, um, well, there's two documents that I, that I came, that we kind of got from some older, smarter builders during this time. I call this my roadmap, and I give this to all my prospects when I meet them. This is my set of fees and expectations. Here's how it's gonna go. Here's how gonna, we're gonna work with you. It's just a little three-page document that we've kind of edited over the years. But I do everything currently cost plus, meaning that I pass along my cost plus a fee. I also don't do any bidding for clients. I'll only work under a professional services agreement. I thought I had an image of it. Y'all have heard the term before. But man, this was a game changer for me 10 years ago now, where no longer was I bidding projects, I was interviewing for projects. And this is something that I really want to emphasize to y'all. Interviewing for projects is so, so different than talking costs and uh, interviewing against several other people that are gonna present a bid and numbers. We get paid for our time as experts. Y'all are experts, you've been in this business a long time. Some of you, 40 years, you need to get paid for your time. For a um, pre-construction services agreement, I, I think of myself like an engineer or an architect. I'm your captain who's gonna tell you how this needs to get built and I'm gonna help you price it correctly. I'm gonna show you where all the costs are and be real transparent about how I get paid and I get paid more than a lot of builders, right? Here's my fee structure. Uh, I'll tell you privately later if you wanna hear what that is. Um, but, uh, but now we take a deposit from them and we ensure that they're our clients before we spend any time working on uh, pricing and estimating for them. Now that's varied over the years and it kind of varies on the client a little bit. If, if uh, the project's further along in design, we don't have as much time in it, they're ready to start, but they hadn't chosen a builder for whatever reason, we might do it for five or uh, 7,500 bucks. If it's a long involved process, you know, we know we're gonna be in design and, and there's a lot of complications, it could be a $30,000 process, but most of my professional services agreements are between 10 and $15,000. And I'm saying, look, I'm gonna be there for you, I'm gonna show you exactly how to build this correctly, I'm gonna be on your team on the same side of the table. And the other thing it does is it makes a really big mental switch for the client. Once they've paid me, I'm their builder, right? When they're just talking to me and they've got several other builders, there's no commitment level on that. They can get pricing from whomever and whatever. But once they've paid me, there's some switch that happens on the trust factor that's really critical for me. And it's, and it's made a giant difference in my business. Okay, so I think I hit all these bullet points uh, already. Let's talk about what I do with my subcontractors, because I think this is also an important topic, uh, especially as we've got a room full of uh, a lot of remodelers. You know, our subs are really the builders. We call ourselves builders. We, we take a bunch of pictures in front of the house and throw it on Instagram, but in reality, when was the last time I actually swung a hammer on a job? It's been a long time, and I'm not very good at swinging hammers. Although I am good with a fluid applied caulking gun. However, those subs are critically important to our success. Now I do have a few in-house guys or you know, in-house subs, so to speak. Uh, here's my crew. I couldn't find a good Christmas picture recently. There's Fat Matt from uh, 2015 or so. But these are guys that are critical to the success of your job. For me, I have some, I basically have two uh, types of guy, or three types of uh, guys that work for me. I have a couple of steel guys that do kind of architectural and structural and kind of details for me. I have some guys that do finished carpentry for me. And then currently I just have one, but I have a, a job site laborer slash uh, guy who doesn't go for work for us. And man, to have those guys on the job is so, so good for me. For instance, I'm here in Vegas today and I have five jobs going on in Austin. Can I be at those jobs? Can I unlock them? Could I sweep up? Could I ensure that Things are happening, no. Now I do have a bigger team these days than I did several years ago, but even when I was a, a, a small builder, like in those early photos that I saw with, that you saw with Stan and Catherine at the beginning, it was me and one other guy, and that was our whole Reisinger Homes company in, in that year. There was just two of us. But I had some critical subs already starting to establish at that point 
that would say, hey, what are you doing, Mr. Plumber? You can't cut that. Put the sawzall down, dude. No, 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 that's, that's a structural member. That's not gonna work. Matt's not gonna be happy about that. Or, hey man, I, I see what you're doing on that caulking. That looks terrible. Literally, some of my subs will say that to other subs because they know what I expect. And man, that's been a huge part of my success now over the years is having that team of guys. Now the Japanese have a term for that. Uh, they, uh, they call it poke yoke. It's, called, it's a term that means basically mistake proofing. And I'm a little bit of a Japanese nerd. But uh, I, I studied the Japanese uh, Toyota production system when I was in college. I thought I was going to build cars for a living uh, instead of build houses. But this is, uh, this is a guy on our, our crew, uh, a subcontractor framer. Uh, we've nicknamed him uh, Chewy. And this is from 2000, I don't know, 10 or 11 on a job site. At this time, Chewy did not speak very good English. And it's the end of the day, it's like five o'clock on a job. My project manager, Ryan, was on vacation that week. So I was visiting all his jobs, like morning and evening to check on things. And I get there at the end of the day, and Chewy's the last framer there at five o'clock. Everyone else is gone. And in kind of broken English, he tells me that we stopped putting the James Hardy siding up on this gable because we got a problem. So I was like, all right, well, what do you mean? So I grabbed my little camera. Uh, this is before digital cameras even. Grab my camera. No, I guess it was digital. It was crappy digital. Anyways, that doesn't matter. Sorry. Uh, so we get up to the gable, and Chewy goes, hey, we stopped the siding because this, this vent doesn't have, uh, I can see all the way into the house through the vent. It doesn't have the blue thing, the azul, you know, the cover. Oh, 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 right, right. Thanks, Chewy. I appreciate that. We well, you know what he was missing. He was making, missing his quick flash. He knew that all of my penetrations on the outside of the house had to have a flashing boot on it, and there was no flashing boots of this size in the flashing boot container on the job, on the job box there. So he timed out on the siding and didn't side over it. And man, that was the aha moment for me, where I said, look, if Chewy, the guy who barely speaks English and probably makes $14 an hour, can know, don't do this, because this isn't how Matt would do it, and he'd only been on the crew for you know, a year at this point, let's say, with my, uh, with my sub, I knew that's key to my success. If the $14 an hour guy is looking after me and my interests, that's a guy I want again. And you'll see him on my videos today. His English is fantastic today. Uh, he has a new baby, and he's an amazing carpenter. And he's been working with me for you know eight, nine, ten years now as a sub. But I, this sub knows I'm always going to use him. Let me talk about the logistics of that for a minute. Now. I'm a cost plus builder, my costs get passed on to my client, but I have a fiduciary duty to make sure that my clients are not, uh, you know, taken to the cleaners or paying too much or, you know, something stupid. So there's no open checkbook with any sub. I don't, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. What I do with, for instance, my frame carpenter is every year annually, I review with him what his price is going to be for me. And I know what his per guy per hour price is as well as his uh, basically man day or crew day price is. And then every project we have that comes in that we're, that we're putting an estimate together for, to put a budget together for, Bill comes in and meets, not with me anymore, but meets with my team and says, okay, this is real similar to this other project, which was a similar scope. How long did it take us to do that project? That took 13 weeks between framing, uh, weatherproofing, and uh, the exterior cornice that we did. This one's really similar, but it's 30% bigger. So I think what we should plug in is 14 weeks plus 30%. So let's plug in 18 weeks of crew time. And the thing about that sub in particular, and many of my subs, is that if I happen to pop in on the job, they're not on Facebook. They're not taking a smoke break. They are getting after it. And that's my contract to them. It's, this is not a written contract. This is my, we talk about it though. Look, you guys do good work for me. You work hard and get it done, you will have work because I currently have work that I need you for. And so I want you to do all my work. Now, on the other hand, I need you to also make sure that if something happens that doesn't meet my standards, that you say something. And sure enough, I've got several of those guys, whether it's painters, framers, electricians, that they treat me like I'm, they're working for their brother. And that is a really big deal for me. And that means that I get terrific quality. Okay, let's switch gears for a minute. Now I've beat that uh, horse a little too much. 
Let's talk about how then I sell that to clients because we're not talking about doing it cheap, we're talking about doing it better, right? Now here's a quick story for you. When I moved to Texas in 2005, I moved from Portland, Oregon. Anyone know GI Joe's in Portland, Oregon? I think they're out of business now, but I bought a, a igloo, like $50 igloo cooler from GI Joe's and I moved that with me. The kind of cooler that basically the lid pops off and snaps about every you know, year and you gotta go buy another one. Man, those are frustrating coolers. So I moved to Texas in 05. I got my crappy igloo cooler. You know, the latch is broken, but it's still limping along. And a bunch of builders in Austin in the back of their trucks, roofers, all these guys, they had these Yeti coolers. This was long before Yeti was a national household name. So they're showing me like big rubber straps, like so hard that your kid's not gonna get a beer out for you. Like serious bomber cooler. So heavy your wife would never think about touching it. You've gotta haul the thing yourself and about throw your back out to move it. But you know what, I was sold, that is a, that's a great cooler. And yet he's crushed it ever since. You know, I, I was uh, a patron of theirs in 2005. By the way, I have no affiliation with them, so don't think I'm giving you a Yeti ad. But what I like about these guys is they are changing the game for us as high performance builders. Look at this ad from them. The cooler is about this big in the ad. It's about the lifestyle. They've got a funny joke about the ex-wife in there. And then if you look at any of their other ads, they go into great depth about how much better built their coolers are. Now it's a little dorky, right? Permafrost insulation, I'm sure this is closed cell foam, right? There's no patented frost insulation that they're using. Fat wall design, what does that mean? It's two inches of closed cell, but they've patented or they've trademarked the term fat wall. They've got an interlocking lid system. It means it's an airtight enclosure. I mean, this is exactly like a building. Why are we not doing awesome ads like this. Well, because they're stinking expensive, that's why. But the point is, people will pay for better if they understand what they're paying for. And here's my last point of the day, because I'm getting tight on time. Um, the last key to my success has honestly been self-promotion. The great and crazy part about self-promotion is that it's free. I read this book in 2006, and I met the author at a custom builder symposium, this guy, David Meerman Scott. It's like 15 bucks on Amazon. Um, and I read that book and saw him speak, and his whole, I can boil down the book for you into a couple sentences. It's still worth reading, but the whole point is, look, traditional advertising, traditional methods to spend your money, that's dead. People are taking a magazine, and they're reading it by the toilet, and it's going in the trash. They're not keeping your ad for, Bill's Custom Homes in Colorado. I should call Bill, I saw his ad in Colorado Times. No, 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 no. But what they are doing, and what I found out very quickly, is they're going online to, to do anything to, about anything, right? So this book said to me in 2006, seven, you should start a blog. There was really not much social media at that time. Facebook, I don't think, was even out at that point. Uh, YouTube was just started around that time. But I started writing a written blog where I like two or three times a month, I'd write a quick uh, note about something nerdy because I thought it was interesting. And I called myself Matt Reisinger in the Green Building blog. And then maybe six months into this, what am I doing? I'm just, you know, I'm throwing trash into the, into the internet. Who knows what's happening? And I went to a meeting like six months after I started doing it. And I it was with an architect and a prospect who was interviewing me for a remodel and the client said, hey, I read that article about your, your fiberglass versus aluminum windows. That was a really well, thanks for writing that. That was really, what, you read that? I mean, the analytics are showing like 30 people read it, but sure enough, he was one of the 30. And then, uh, do you remember flip video cameras? It was like before your cell phone, I mean, these, this thing is crazy. You could go to the moon, or you could film the build show on this in 4K if you wanted to. Oh my gosh, I've got 100 texts. Um, before cell phones took any video, this is like the StarTac flip phone days, flip video came out with this camera that was just one little thing. All you do is just point at it. So I'd be like, hey, Mr. Plumber, take a video of me. And my buddy's like, hey, you should check out this YouTube thing. Like publish a video on YouTube and then put that on your blog. And again, it was like, you know, I thought, why, is, why am I doing this? Like 32 people have viewed this video. And this is 2008 when I started. I guess I should keep doing it. So I did it for like six months. I published like one or two videos a month. And here I am like six months into YouTube and I go to a meeting with a client 
uh, with a prospect, not a client, someone I had never met before. And George goes, hey, Matt, it's so good to finally meet you. I was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And it was the same thing like my blog. George says, man, I watched all eight of your videos on YouTube. That was fantastic. I was really impressed with your knowledge about blah, 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 blah. And that's when I said, this, this has it. And again, the th or not again, the thing that I want to stress to you is it's not about the numbers. Yes, I have a lot of people that watch my YouTube videos now, but when it comes to success for my business, it was just as successful when I had a video that had 67 views as I have a video that has 1,000 views today or some other number. It's really important to put yourself out there regularly because people aren't buying uh, a Chevy from you, right? They're buying from you. I don't know how big your companies are. I don't think there's any, uh, you know, thousand employee builders or modelers in this room. It's about you. It's about your processes. People want to do business with people they like. The reason why I've liked working with my framer over the years is because he's a great guy and I enjoy spending time with him and he's enjoyable to work with. If he was a great craftsman but he was a jerk, he would have been fired long ago. The same goes with our clients who hire us. They like us. They want to trust us. They're going to work with people they like. So by you putting yourself out there and actually spending a little time on this, it's money and time well spent. And the other thing is, it's basically free. What does Instagram cost? It costs nothing for you. You don't need to do promotions. You don't need to spend money on ads. Just commit to some schedule, whether that's one or two pictures a week or one or two videos a week, and do it. You got to do it. It's really important for your businesses. And for me, the thing that, I, that only took a few years in my local market, I moved to Texas uh, in 05. I had never built a single house in Texas. I moved from out of state. I'd moved from Portland. I was originally a Yankee, and Texans don't like that, so don't tell anybody. And within a couple of years, people knew who I was in Austin because I had these dumb YouTube videos. And you know, oh, oh, I guess 08 when I started to 2012, we're talking about you know, 3,000 people that subscribe to me. So this is not like I have some massive following, but all the builders and all the architects in town knew who I was and I had a reputation for doing things well. It didn't mean I was gonna get some $10 million jobs, but it did mean that I automatically had a reputation for being a good guy who was smart and built a good project. And having that builder community know that, and especially the architect community that was driving business, that was hugely uh, important to my success, even to this day. Guys, that's all I've got for you. It's been about an hour. We've got a giveaway to give, and I've got about 10 minutes for questions. Why don't we do some questions, and if the BMC folks would come up and uh, help me out with the giveaway, let's do that. Anybody have any questions from today or just in general that I can answer?